All right, now let's get down to business and let's talk about what you'll actually be doing. In fact, related to what you'll actually be doing, look at all these colors. These are all the protein sequences that I have been looking at to try to figure out how should we group our different proteins? What should we expect from the proteins that you're making? And in fact, you can use this kind of this kind of uh, file as well. And I'm going to be giving you some of the information that we've done because we've got a lot of genomes, right? We can tell a lot about what's going on from the gene sequence, but not everything. We need to actually make the protein and watch it, see what happens. So this is what I've done in my lab. That's what happened in Roland's lab. And actually, there's a lot of other stuff that he did with it in the um, decade or so before uh, we took up the project over here at SPU. Uh, but when we did, we started to make our own lipocalins. And it was a bit of a rocky start. I'll mention a little bit about that. But there's a, they eventually paid off and gave us a really fascinating mystery that we can solve, something I didn't expect above and beyond what I hoped for, which can happen with science sometimes. It's one of the great things about it. It's a pain sometimes, right? Just like real life. But it can actually be more than you expect. So I'll tell you, first off, let's start off with what we expect. We expected to be able to replicate what Dave did. We expected to be able to grow human sideracalin in the proper cells and to get an orange protein out of it. And spoiler alert, we did. So sideracalin immunoproteins, remember the human sideracalin will bind in terabactin, which is made by the XO1 blue slash DH5 alpha um, cells that we use. And it actually will be made by those cells, will be put into the, um, the sideracalin as we express it, and we'll be able to purify that out. So that's what I first started out. Actually, I started this project in 2017, and we started with making recombinant lipocalins. And you want to see each lab section has a maximum of 16 students. And the way we divide it up is we divide and conquer, but we have the students don't work alone. You all know that. Um, so we have four benches in each, and so we can make five different proteins, and we did them in three different strains the first time. Now, the one thing that we did with these, now, just to remind you all of what you've done, you've transformed cells with plasmids, you've expressed them in E. coli, and then you're going to, uh, you've, you're going to purify them by a different kind of chromatography. You might have noticed that we are not going to purify with nickel NTA chromatography like we did in 2017. We're doing things differently now. But we had it set up differently then. And um, I was trying this thing where we used a different kind of plasmid to sort of help things along to express it in the paraplasm. And, you know, we got, actually got proteins, but we didn't get enough of them. I want more protein. And so in 2018, we decided to go back to the drawing board as far as it comes to expression protocol. And instead of using the other thing I found in the literature, I decided to go to the people I knew. And I called up my contact in Roland's lab and I asked him, how do you make your proteins? I want to do exactly that. And so that's what we did. And so we made them in E. coli. We made them in some BL21 cells and some DH5 alpha cells. Uh, and we purified them by GST tag affinity. This is something you'll learn about, and you'll be talking about this in the report. But the topic of this is not about that. Um, you'll learn that when it's time, and you'll be doing that actually next week. We actually tried some things like a thrombin digest and we did spin columns and stuff like that. We change what we do after we make the proteins every year because we've always got new things to look at. So, and that's when we got the really cool result that I wanted to keep building on. For the next two years, we pretty much kept doing the same thing. We uh, kept making more proteins like that and we were able to replicate some, not all of the results. And we're, this year we're gonna to try to replicate more of the results. And I'll tell you about exactly what that is. But this is the protocol that you're used to. Now, you'll notice in 2020, at the, after the end of winter quarter, we had a little bit of a disruption. And that disrupted this research as well. During the COVID disruption, I actually uh, got another project going. And I worked on that for a few years. And that was a lot of fun. Um, but now we are, uh, I've been itching to come back to this project. And so now this year we have time to go back to this project. Maybe we'll flip back and forth between projects. Who knows? But you got to take it project by project, year by year. This year we're going back to what we did in 2020. And so the question is, we're starting with Ro Roland's and Dave's human Sidera-Kalin uh, uh, sequence. 
And we want to know what other species make similar sidericalin-like molecules. And so I followed a protocol that would organize all the lipocalins that are in the big database called PFAM of 5,400 sequences. And it would take all of those and it would uh, organize those sequences into groups. This is what I got out of it. And you see that there's that big group in the middle, which has lots of subgroups inside it. That group was the one that had our human sidericalin sequence in it. And so, um, by the way, the boxes are big where we have more information in the form of a crystal structure or an enzyme functional assay. Basically, if we have a paper that talked about that gene, it's a big box on this. And you see that there's one of the biggest and most complex groups includes our sidericalin. So there's galaxies more to explore out there, but we're going to focus on that blue group in the middle. So we zoom in on that. Each of these is sort of a, 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 a typical sequence. It's um, even not all the sequences, but you kind of group similar sequences together into one box. So ultimately, this is probably about a thousand sequences that you see right here that are represented by this. And the computer has put similar sequences close together, dissimilar sequences far apart. And you can see when it does this, we're ending up with not a blob, but a structured set of groups of sequences. And we can look around for the ones with big boxes where we have papers that tell us what those sequences do or what their structures are. And so, for example, human sidericalin is in the Northwest group, which I called group three. And I basically numbered, um, I actually numbered seven groups, but I only used six of them so far. Um, so depending on what I feel like, I could say six or seven. So you see group three is in the northwest corner. In the northeast corner, we have chicken XFABP, which we know does actually still act as a sidericalin. It binds siderophores, right? But it also has that weird little phospholipid binding pocket underneath. So it's the same but different. And it's kind of cool that the group is close but different. Uh, the other thing that we know is, remember, we have an enzyme. That is the yellow. When we have enzymatic activity, I colored that yellow to stand out. And you look, we have a couple of examples of enzymatic activity that are located in the group between the other groups. So I numbered that group, group two. And in fact, I think I have all of them here. Group two is the enzymes. And um, so we have group one, two, three, if you see group one is all the way over there. And by the way, the first number of the protein you're expressing is your group number. You'll notice that we have groups one, three, and five represented this year. And so they're all on different sides. They're close together. They might be sidericalins or they might bind something else. Um, they're similar. Groups four and six look more different. And it's interesting because we don't have much, much functional data about these. But what we have is group six looks like it's the alpha one microglobulin, which you remember binds heme, a very different molecule, still iron containing, right? But a very different shape. It, this gives me hope that the sequence tool is working to organize these into groups that are similar in sequence and also similar in function. And that means that if we want to get something that's similar but different, which is exactly where the best results are, we want to get to a group that is close, but not the same group. And so that's why we're trying things from groups one, three, and five. If we want, in the past, we have tried a selected number of things from four and six. I don't think we've ever tried a group seven, actually. I'll have to look on the screen. I, I have, we've tried a bunch of stuff. So what we've done is we've actually done, we've gotten some interesting results from the 3A protein, which is actually colored pink. And that's located in the group three, but you see it's a little bit distant from the human SCN. And then the 5F protein is located in group five, and you see it's pointing exactly to where that is in this representation of the sequence space. 1C is a yellow protein, and those of you who are on Tuesdays might have noticed that you have a lot of group one proteins. Everyone's making a group one protein because we have gotten our most consistently interesting results from group one. So I want to keep hammering at that group. So you notice I showed that you that multiple sequence alignment right there. What I, what I did with that is I independently took all these sequences, the ones I was interested in, 
and I put them all into this multiple sequence alignment and it stacked them up and organized them. And what's cool is when it organized them, it put group three, it didn't know what was group three and group two, but it put them together and you put all the group threes together on the top here. It put all the group twos together on the bottom and you can see that a different tool gave the same results. So that means that both the tools agree the group three sequences are more like each other than they are like the group two sequences. There might be a functional difference if you have that kind of pattern in the sequence similarity. And if you look up and down here, you can see, yeah, there, some of the colors are the same. These are colored according to their chemistry. Um, and so you can tell from the pattern of the colors, they're mostly the same, but there's definite differences. I think they're about 20 to 30% identical, which, which if you remember from the previous slide, is right in the range where we think it could be a sidericalin binding iron binding pro, uh, iron binding molecules, or it could be something else entirely, or it could be a bifunctional protein like the chicken XFABP. So very cool stuff. So the best part of this whole thing was in 2018 when we, um, because remember 2017 was a little bit of a dud. We only made a little bit of protein. We were able to squeeze some results out of it, but I wanted more. In 2018, we got more because uh, we were able to recreate the human sidericalin orange. Now, the one thing that we did, and honestly, this is sort of my mistake, but I sort of wanted to see what would happen. We actually made two preps, one in DH5-alpha and one in BL21, and we mixed them together. So the color we got was actually fainter than I expected, but then I realized, oh, it could be because it's half and half. It's half full and half empty because that would make perfect sense. The good news is whatever it happens, we are getting the right color from it. So, uh, but group one, here's the other colors. And in fact, you can barely see the orange color all the way on the right for the human sidericalin. But then we have the group, and I show you the groups here. The group five protein is all the way on the left and it was blue. The group one protein was bright yellow, like a bright yellow, um, unmistakable. And the three A protein was pink. And so we have three different colors from the three different groups. And that was really cool. That's a sign that we're actually onto something here. So we wanted to replicate it. So we tried replicating all the colors at once and we replicated one of them twice. The other ones didn't replicate. It doesn't really surprise me because there's probably like a 50-50 or maybe even a 1 in 3 chance of replication if you're just completely random. And that's kind of what we got. We just happened to replicate the yellow one more. So I actually did a blast search around the original 1C protein sequence and I looked for things with 75% sequence identity. I wanted to see if I had high identity, could I replicate this same color with a 75% identical sequence? From another species? And the answer was yes. Two of them were made by different groups. It resulted in yellow proteins. The colors look similar. Um, none of the others that we tried that year actually gave us color, but again, that's probably what, what I expect. I'm just happy to have some colors to look at. Because remember, most of the times they made the sidericalin, it was not colored. It was only Dave's lucky break that got them the orange protein in the first place. So in 2020, we tried again. I made two more uh, group one proteins. They also were yellow. And also the other ones were not colored yet. So um, the other thing that we did both of those years, we always used all BL21 cells. We didn't use any DH5 alphas. So that's why this year I'm going back to DH5 alphas again. You might have noticed. We also did binding assays. And the cool thing about this, because the products are colored, you can do some binding assays and you can just look at it and say, do I think that there's some iron bound? And you can see this, there's a faint yellow color to the one on the right. Um, that's a possible signal of iron. It's a simple binding assay, but um, it's promising. So these different species that came from, and this is before the 2020 sequences were gathered. Uh, this is something presented pre-COVID. And so um, notice that the one group one proteins are all from different fish. And in fact, if I look up and down group one, all of those are from fish. I want you to look that up to confirm it for yourself, but I believe that uh, group one is all fish and that might be a clue to what the yellow thing is that is binding to them. Maybe fish use retinoic acid in a certain way. That could be yellow. Uh, and so it could be a retinoic acid binding protein. Who knows? Let's see. The 3A is actually from guinea pig. That's the one that was pink. 
and it's actually 93% identical to the human uh, sidericalin. So it's very similar. Remember, it's the same group. And yet we got that bright pink color, which I've never been able to replicate. By the way, oh, we have replicated some orange colors. So I, I should take it back that um, we we do have some orange that has been replicated. Uh, it's, it's just that that's probably enterobactin, you know. Then the um, the one that I, blows my mind is the blue. There's not many things that are blue like that. Uh, and it's from the Galago. It's a different group. So we want to try more five Fs, and you might have noticed we're trying to replicate that this year. And we're also we've all only done it in BL twenty one cells. Let's try it in DH five alpha. Let's see what happens. So this is my taking um, all the protein sequences or examples of protein sequences from the three different groups and also the enzymes because those are really cool. But this is basically groups one, three, and five. I put them through my own sequence alignment program, and it came out with this right here where you have group one on top, it recapitulated the groups, group one on top, group five in the middle, group three on the bottom, and the enzymes way down below off doing their own thing, which is nice because we have hints that those are truly different groups and the sequences are grouped together in ways that go with what our lab results tell us. The other thing that's on this, this is really important. If you see a four character PDB ID, then you have a, um, a PDB uh, code that goes with that. And so that's where we have structures. And notice that we have one, two, three, four, five, and there's two more at the bottom that are just way off. Um, there, are, there are at least four different structures mixed in with our groups, one, five, and three. So I want you to pay attention to that. Um, the proteins that we've made that have been different colors before are located here, and I've shown you them on the sort of 2D graph that we had before, and this is just showing you them on a more um, systematized graph. But you see they're right in the middle of each respective group. So it looks like each group does sort of cluster around the interesting colors that we have. doesn't necessarily mean that the other ones in that group will be colored, but it, I think it improves the chances. So let's zoom in on group one and Tuesday people, you're all making group one and you're all using BL21 cells because that's what we've done the last two years that we did this project. So let's do it again. But this time, last project, we did these five different proteins and these are all yellow. I didn't want to go too far away because I wanted to replicate. This year, I'm doing these proteins. And so you see there's one thicket in the middle, the one CFF, the, the one CF but there's one A and one C E that are a little bit farther out. I'm expecting these will still be yellow, but the farther out we go, the more chance we have of being surprised one way or the other. So let's see what happens. The other thing that we have is we have group five and group three. And the, the one thing that I just looked up today for the first time is I wanted to see where that retinoic acid, remember how we had that one retinoic acid binding protein that Roland looked at way back in the year 2000? Uh, that is actually, I looked up what retinoic acid is because beta carotene is orange. You cut it in half, it's probably still colored. And it turns out that retinoic acid is usually colored. They say it's sort of a yellowish color in the powder form. So this could be yellow. The only other thing, though, is that it lies between groups five and one, five and three. It does not lie, uh, coordinate with group one. Um, so it's a little bit of a puzzle, but uh, it's something that I want to keep in mind as a hypothesis for where that color might come from. Here are the ones that we're making. We're making one group 5 protein, although we're making it two ways. And we're making um, two, yeah, we're making two group 3 proteins. We're making one that is 3A that we're doing it again, but we're doing it in the DH5 alpha cells. And we're doing our good old standard of human sidericalin. We need some regular sidericalin to compare all of our other proteins to, and also to replicate Dave's work with just the DH5 alphas, which hopefully will give a stronger color. Let's see. One thing to do, but try. So this is a list of all the proteins we made in our lab. And yes, in winter 2019, we actually did make two more orange proteins from the group three. And so this says that group three people, you might see an orange protein, if you're lucky, you might see a pink protein, and we might be able to get to the bottom of what makes it pink. But notice that this year we are finally going back to using DH5 alphas for expression, 
because, um, yeah, let's go back to the original weird break that Dave had, and let's see if other proteins might bind something special from that as well. So just notice these details are important. Keep track of these, talk about these, think about what they might mean, and as you observe what happens with your protein, we'll interpret it in those lights. And whatever happens with your protein, good or bad, we, it's a result that we will interpret. It's a unique result that is uniquely yours. So don't worry about what if this doesn't work. It's going to work one way or the other. Um, as long as you do the, do the protocols, we'll be able to say, hey, this gives us a protein that's uncolored, or this protein doesn't refold well, or this or that. Your whole project is, um, is going to work no matter what, as long as you put in the hours and you put in the work. I will, I will make sure of it. So what you're going to do, week four, you're going to do lysis and column chromatography. That's next week. Week five, you'll do protein gels. And week six is experiment week. I'll tell you about that in a second. Week seven is our victory lap where we set up crystal trays. That's kind of fun. And then we check out. And believe it or not, we'll be done. So in week six, we're going to do, I'm not sure what we're going to do yet because it's going to depend on what we see in the previous weeks. Uh, but I'm going to want to set you loose in the lab to try some experiments like what Dave did in his original 2002 paper, where we look at the visible spectrum, visible absorbance of these things, if they have visible color, or if they don't, we'll try to give them visible color, you see? So we're going to try different things, and again, maybe it won't work. But even not working is an experiment that happens that tells us something. So just do the experiments as well as you can, Make sure that we know something, whether it works or not works, is secondary if we know for sure that it did work or that it didn't. That's knowing something. So we're going to see maybe if it's colored, we're going to try to change its color by unfolding it. If it's not colored, we're going to see if we can make it colored by adding a colored binding uh, molecule. And the real continuation of this will be in Survey of Physical Chemistry Chem 3410. So I do want to note if you need a lecture lab course with a chem prefix, that is a great sequence, and it's sort of a hidden continuation of what we are doing here. Uh, and also, it helps with the MCAT. So let me just give that little plug. I love to have students continue from Biochem 2 into 3410, because you might even be able to use your same protein and find out more about it. So basically, just not, I want to tell you this right now, because I want you to know this is actually a really cool opportunity. You're sort of an apprentice in a lab. And those of you who saw the talk at Capstone this week, this Monday, where Abi talked, and everything that he said that he's doing right now, this work prepares you to do his job. And so you can get a job like he did going out. And I can talk to you about the search and what it's like, um, but I have had a lot of success with students going. These are ind industry standard protocols, and they work well. They make a lot of protein. So let's uh, see how they work, and we will talk. Just remember, this is really the beginning. You are stepping off from this into the rest of your life, but you can also build a project from it that you can keep with you um, for the rest of your life, in a sense. All right, with all that, thanks for listening. Let's, uh, I'll see you in the lab, and uh, let's think about what this all means.